right. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. Exactly. All right. I think then we're all set. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And those two. How was the key to you guys with the first two songs? Good. Yeah. I was I was okay with it. The key to the first two songs. Um, is it too high? Is it too low? Is it, it was like, fine. It's, um, okay. I'm it's just in my high range, but um, you're doing the high range, so like I'm trying not to play catch up, but it seems not to be in harmony. Okay, cool. I love yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I can do. I know. Because I'm like I don't want to change me. This is silly. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's yeah, well, like yeah. the high is it? I'll just lean back. If it's too high, I'll just go too high. Is that okay? Right. Sounds great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. And, and then she wants to find out. But I'm on horto. Total horto. Like a, a low also. Because someone told me it's in a high hotel, because I was like, what voice is this? That's a low hotel. Mm. Is it a low hotel? Like an alto, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I love Lenny, it. I'm you know Lenny who I am. Good, I love that. It's broke and everything. What are you? I'm probably like a soprano. Soprano, you sound soprano. Yeah, yeah. You, she can she high key, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> All right. That's why it's, we do so well, is because like I'm a mezzo-soprano. Okay. So I'm like between a soprano so you can go and going and lower. lower yes. and so yes. I, my default is I want to sing things lower. Um, but higher. I like yeah. that. But I know that my true voice is when I go a little bit higher. So that's higher, I, can I need see to build underneath. confidence in that. Because yes. I always feel like I sound weird. Oh. <laughs> no, I, was gonna say I hear it. I, was I like, hear I it. I was like, I'm working through it. As I ask Thomas go. asked me to do this, I'm just working through it all. Like, it's as I'm doing it. Yes. Exposure therapy. Yes, you know? exactly. Exposure therapy. Yes. I'm glad it's not shock therapy. You're glad what? I'm glad it's not shock therapy. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> trying to make my way through this job. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> what number are you? Five. You're, are you the yeah. number one? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so fun. Mm -hmm. And so you have four or six kids. Is there like a big age gap between you guys? Um, he's got a year and the oldest is like, our oldest is like three, four years apart. Oh, wow. Okay. And me and the closest is like, me and my sister Donna and Michael are actually like five years apart. Okay. We are, so me and the oldest is like 15 years.
anybody in here? There's still some folks out in the narthex that could come in. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Trinity. My name is Tom. I'm the pastor here, and we're excited about what God's doing here in our midst, whether you've decided to come and join us here in person or you're joining us online. Uh, we have seen the Holy Spirit working throughout this year, and we're excited this morning. We get to welcome in two new members to our, our family, two people who have said yes um, to Jesus, to have said yes to, I'm in, I want to be a part of this family. And so we'll be celebrating that later on um, this morning, and we have the opportunity to come together. We've been talking about the Jesus way over the course of the fall, really since um, the beginning of uh, September, and so we're going to keep digging into that. We've got two more Sundays of just really what is the way of Jesus all about. And we're talking this morning about discernment, about being open to God's movement, about acknowledging God's authority in our lives and responding to his leadership. And so our call to worship this morning, it, it um, reflects this idea of, of wanting God to lead us, of being open. And I think that's what I want to invite you into this morning, I want to invite you into, and maybe even just do an open-handed posture this morning, that are you open, are you willing to let God take the wheel and drive your life? Are you willing to let God give you direction, to give you guidance, um, not just when you feel like you need it, but at all the time, are you willing to be open-handed and let God lead. And so that is the, the theme of our call to worship. I invite you to stand as you're able and join into these words this morning. You're going to see the words on the screen. And when you see those uh, words in yellow, would you respond as we set the tone for our time together? So who among you is seeking the wisdom of God? We long to hear God's words spoken to our hearts. Who among you is seeking God's bright and holy truth? We long to learn the ways of wisdom and righteousness. Who among you is seeking a spirit-filled life? Lead us, Lord, in spirit and truth. God grants wisdom generously to all who ask. Come here, people of God. Let us worship in wisdom and truth.
new song that we're going to sing. Um, it's called Make Room. It's been a year. <laughs> you guys have been so resilient, and I've noticed as an outsider coming here just how you guys have gone through a lot of changes and have flowed with them. And um, I love seeing what the Lord is doing here, and I love seeing how you guys are participating alongside with him and what he's doing. So I am praying that he continues to do amazing things in this church and through you. And this is a song, it's a prayer um, that we're going to sing about just allowing God to do that, just continuing to surrender to him and just saying, Lord, this is... This is your church, this is your body, this is your kingdom, and we're just going to be vessels and allow you to do the beautiful work that you do through us. So we're going to, um, I'm going to do the chorus so that you guys can just familiarize yourself with it, and then we'll start at the top. Whatever you want to 
is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. the faith God we ask for you to help rebuild create and make us whole again we surrender all the past our current present and the future unto you God take perfect control in Jesus name we pray amen Good morning. Ooh, that's loud. We have a nice full church today. Welcome, everybody. All right. Um, if you are visiting with us for the first time, we ask that you fill out the Connect card in the pew and put it in the box at the back of the church so we can know you were visiting with us and get to know you a little bit. Also, those of you online, if you can go to the Connect card online as well, or just put a little hi in the Facebook post, we'll know that you're watching us online. And if you have any uh, prayer concerns, there's a yellow card in the pew. We would love to pray um, for you. So you can drop that in the box at the back of the church as well. All right, first we are decorating today for Christmas. I hope a lot of you are able to stay and help. Many hands make light work as the saying goes. So um, hopefully lots of you can stay. We do have lunch for those that stay and help decorate. Um, hopefully an hour at the most would be great. So let's hope a lot of us stay to help. Um, next week is our congregational meeting. Um, you should have received an email with the ballot and the, um, about the, the information about the meeting. Um, if you did not, let the church office know um, so that we can make sure you get that. We'll also be going over the New Year's budget. And then last, um, the gather, gratitude gathering is at 6.30, November 27th at, uh, on Wednesday in place of Bible study. So if you come to Bible study, um, please come to this as well. And please invite a friend. Um, there is an RSVP if you can let us know you're coming. But if, even if you decide last minute, please come anyway and bring friends. Now is our time to pass the peace. Jesus stands before us offering us his peace. By exchanging the peace with one another, it should be a reminder that we are not alone, that we worship in community with each other. Christ gathered disciples around himself, and now he calls us into community as well. Please rise and share a sign of Jesus' love and peace with each other. All right. I'm going to invite up. I'm going to invite up Jamie 
and Phoenicia to come stand up here with me. We're welcoming new members this morning. And um, I'm going to invite Celia up to you to stand because we're going to play the doxology after we do this because we're excited about new members, right? Um, before I, we get into this, um, I do want to just thank you for how you've all been generous. Um, as Celia's talked about, it, in the last really couple years, I have seen God calling out different ones to make this their church home, to come and invest their talents, their time, and their gifts, and you continually do that, and it's really exciting. Um, and so we're, we're really grateful for those who um, call Trinity their home and want to invest in financially. There is an offering box in the back. You can also, um, in the back of the bulletin, there's a couple of different ways that you can contribute financially, but... Now, we're just excited that there are more and more people that are saying, yes, I want to make this church your home. So I want to invite over Jamie and Phoenicia. Don't trip on the cords. There's like a million of them. Um, so friends in Christ, we are received into the church by our baptism and by our free and sincere confession of faith. These persons have discovered this church to be a place of nurture and growth and a place where they sense the support of others in their desire to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Through prayer and study, they have been led by the Holy Spirit to claim in our presence their relationship to the Lord and the members of this church. They share with us the desire to serve Jesus Christ using the unique gifts granted them by the Holy Spirit. So friends, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. We are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. We who believe are carefully joined together, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you are also joined together as part of this dwelling where God lives by his, by his Holy Spirit. And so we thank God for you, for both of you. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, he has made you a part of his universal church and has led you to unite with this congregation. I now call on you to affirm your faith in the presence of God and your, and your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I'm going to ask you a few questions, and you can respond by saying, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and promise to follow him as Lord? I do. You have made public confession of your faith and have been baptized. Do you accept the Holy Scriptures, the Old and New Testaments, as the Word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct? If so, say, I do. Do you intend to live among God's faithful people, to hear God's word and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ for the word and deed, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? I do. And do you also promise to support the ministries of this church, including the conference and denomination to which, be, to which we belong? If so, say, I do. I do. So members of this family, we're gonna, it says congregation in the liturgy, but I'm going to say family because we're using the language family. Members of this family, do you receive these believers into your fellowship and care? If so, will you answer with an enthusiastic, we do. We do. Did you hear that? It's good stuff. Let me welcome up the board members. So any of our executive board members that are with us this morning to gather around these two wonderful women of God. And for those of you who are in the congregation, I want you to step up a little bit so they can get behind you. Um, And as we pray, you got it, Greg? Okay. 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 We're good. We're going to take a minute. Um, we're all like ready to, that's what we do, right? We're a family. We're ready to support. Um, so we're going to pray. Um, we're going to lay hands as a board, but we also want to invite you as you're able to extend your hand out just to, as you are joining into this prayer as well. And once we have said amen, I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to sing the doxology together. Thank God for bringing these two wonderful women and the work that God is doing in our midst. Amen? All right, so let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful for these two women. We're thankful for Jamie and for Phoenicia, for their lives that have been submitted to you, God, that they have been following the leading of your Holy Spirit, God, you have been drawing them to, to say, yes, I want to be a part of this family. So God, may we now embrace them as our sisters. Might they feel that support. May they feel that encouragement. Might they feel that we are locked arm in arm with them, Lord, that we love them, we care for them. 
and that they are part of the family. And God, we pray for others this morning, Lord, who might feel far away, who might feel all alone. God, might they feel drawn. Might they, might they know, God, that, that you welcome them, Lord, and you call us to welcome them as well. God, I think about um, those who are recovering from procedures, Lord. I think about Chuck Havel, Lord. I think about Andy Noren this morning. God, I pray that they would feel the prayers of this family and the support and love of this family as well. God, I, I think of Mel Mueller, Lord, who was in the hospital um, the last couple of days, Lord, with pneumonia, Lord. Might he sense your strength and know that, God, we love him, even though he is living a, uh, away from this local uh, area, from Oak Lawn, Lord, that he might know that you care for him, that you love him. And so, Lord, you called us to be your hands and feet in this world. You call us to um, shine your light, and we can only do that with your help, Lord. So we fix our eyes on you, Jesus. We pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, which begins, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, would you stand as we sing the doxology? seated and now let's hear the word of the Lord. The scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 through 20. Enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. This is the word of the Lord. Have you ever wondered Is it worth it? We talk about following Jesus. We talk about surrendering our lives to his leadership, to following his lead. We say in our songs that we want to make room for Jesus. But have you ever wondered, like, yeah, but is anybody else going to do this? Is anybody else going to live this kind of life? Is anybody else going to join in? Sometimes following Jesus feels a little lonely. Amen? And it made me think about something that I experienced yesterday, actually the last two weekends. So um, how many of you in the last few weeks have spent some part of your week raking leaves? Anybody? Some of you guys are like, nope, I'm not doing it yet. Some of you are smarter than me. I'll tell you this. Last Saturday, I said, okay, Amy, I think it's time. You know, you play that game. You're looking and you're like, Are the leaves down? Are there more leaves coming? When do I rake? You look at the other lawns in the neighborhood and you're like, okay, are we doing this? Is it time? And then we just, so we just decided, uh, last Saturday we said, okay, we're going to rake leaves. 
And we filled seven, ba- seven Ace Hardware lawn waste bags of leaves, and we thought, this is great. Felt really good about ourselves, felt really accomplished, enjoyed the rest of our Saturday. Got up for church on Sunday, and guess what I saw on my lawn? Leaves. All my neighbor's leaves who did not make the same decision that we did on that same day, and they didn't. So all of their leaves, they decided to share with us. How considerate, right? And so guess what we did yesterday? I got the lawnmower out this time. I'm like, forget raking. I'm going to mow the lawn. I'm going to get the bagger. It's a little bit easier. And sometimes I think following Jesus is like raking leaves. Because I think sometimes we take this calling that we're going to follow the Jesus way. We're going we're to follow this path that God has us on, but we wonder, is anybody else going to do it with me? Am I all by myself? Am I going to make any difference? I just got to go clean it up again and again and again, and I got to actually not only deal when it comes to re- leaf raking, I got to not only deal with my, my issues now, I'm taking on your issues. That doesn't seem quite fair. Can't we just all agree that we're going to do this together? And you know what, friends? It's just not how it works. It doesn't, following Jesus does not guarantee that your life is going to go smoothly. Following Jesus doesn't guarantee that you're going to have lots of money in your bank account. Following Jesus doesn't mean that you're necessarily are going to have less anxiety. Um, and so you might say, so is it worth it? Is it really worth it? Is, do we really believe that this Jesus way that we are talking about is actually worth my life? And Jesus addresses this in the scripture that Nitsa just read in Matthew chapter 7. And I want to encourage you to follow with me as we get towards the tail end of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 13, says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Only a few. And so it raises a lot of questions for me. It says that the way to life, Jesus said what? I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly or have it to the full, depending on what translation. Same thing. The the narrow gate leads to life, that life. But have you ever had the thought in your mind of, does it really? Or do sometimes we look at our friends and our neighbors and our family members who aren't don't have the same commitment to follow Jesus, and we say, yeah, that looks more fun. You mean I don't have to give of myself? You mean I don't have to make commitments like Jamie and Phoenicia just did to a family? You mean I don't? I can just do whatever I want? Isn't that better? As a matter of fact, I don't know that we are always convinced that following Jesus is actually better for us. I think for some of us, we're just like, well, I got to do what I got to do. I want to go to heaven, so I'll do what I got to do. But you know what? That's not what Jesus said. Jesus Jesus didn't say, I've come so you can go to heaven when you die. Now, that is a wonderful byproduct. He said, I've come so that you might have life today, right now. But does following Jesus really feel like life? Are we actually convinced that it is actually life-giving? I was actually teaching a Sunday school class years ago of, of college students. And I asked the question, I said, what if you could do whatever you want, like literally whatever you want, with zero, with zero consequences and still go to heaven? Would you want to do that? And I think they thought it was like a trick. <laughs> I think they thought I was like, they were like, kind of like, and the one bold person said, yeah, why would I not want to do whatever I want to do and still go to heaven? That sounds perfect. Like, that's honestly, and, and I think if she would have kept talking, she would have said, honestly, that's what I'm doing anyway. I'm doing whatever I want to do. 
And I hope that that prayer that I prayed when I was eight will hold me, will get me to heaven. Friends, I would like to suggest this morning that if all you are looking for is a ticket to paradise without any kind of discipleship, without any kind of commitment to Jesus, I think you're going to be very surprised when you meet eternity. And I know it's like, whoa, wait a minute, this just got really real. But this idea of the narrow gate and the wide gate, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Jesus is talking to religious leaders as well as the crowd. And you know what? I think oftentimes our tendency when we read scriptures like this is to say, well, I really feel bad for those wide road people. I'm on the narrow road. I know I'm on the narrow road. I've got it figured out. I'm connected. Um, I'm, I'll pray for those wide road people. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to get you to say. Are you sure? Are you really sure that you're on the narrow road? Because, my friends, the, the Jesus way is both countercultural and counterintuitive. As we have read through the Sermon on the Mount, talking about the first will be last and the last will be first, and, you know, we got to deal with our own garbage before we think about confronting somebody else. And if you have hatred in your heart, it's the same as killing somebody, and the same as if you have lust in your mind, it's the same as actually committing the act. Like, that is not something our culture talks about. We tend to want to drizzle Jesus on top of our worlds, our culture, our value system. Like, let me just get a little Jesus. It's kind of like when you go to, like, the, like Chipotle. I don't know if you've ever been to Chipotle, but you go through the line, you get your fixings, you get your rice, you get your meat. And at the end, they go, what do you want for toppings? It's like, you know, I want some cheese, but maybe just a little cheese. Or I want a sour cream. Or some of, some of you people are those weird people that are like, you just put it in a bath of sour cream. I don't even want to see anything else. Um, so that's some of you people. That's not me. But that's some of us, right? But we typically live, I think, our Christian life on just drizzle a little. I, I like the way my life sort of works. I like the control I have over it. I like that it's manageable. I like that it's up to me. And so, Jesus, can you just bless my stuff? Can you just bless my way? I don't really want the Jesus way. I want the Tom way. I like the Tom way. I like, I like uh, Burger King. Have it your way. I'm all about that. That's my actual value system. I want it my way. And when I don't get it my way, man, I don't really like that very much. So can you just drizzle a little bit over there? But you know, friends, that's the wide road. I want to suggest this morning that what Jesus is calling us to is not Sunday mornings for an hour or Wednesday nights for an hour and a half or five-minute devotions in the morning. Jesus is saying, I want you to let me take your life. Not take your life as if your life is over, but let me, will you put your life in my hands? And I think it's an active word. If you notice the scripture, he says, enter. Enter the narrow gate. You got to step into it. You have to trust God enough to say, here you go. It's not a passive thing where you just lay back and say, okay. You know, like when you go to the dentist, which I got to get to the dentist pretty soon. But when you go to the dentist, you don't have any control, right? You just lay back in the chair. They pry your mouth open and you say, do whatever you got to do. And you, that's, that's not discipleship. It isn't just a passive thing where we just lay back and say, God, just do what you got to do. We have a part to play. We are invited to walk on a road, but it says that very few are going to find it. Because we don't really want to find it. We don't really want to trust God like that because I think deep down we're not really sure. We're, really, we're not really sure that entrusting our lives in God's hands is really the best life. And so we tend to find voices pastors, podcasts, whatever, that tell us what we want to hear, that affirm what we want to hear, that affirm the way that we think, that make us feel good. And so Jesus warns about that too in verse 15. It says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. 
So what's a prophet? A prophet is somebody who, who will make a claim that they speak for God. That what you hear coming out of their voice is really God's word. And probably for many of us, if we heard somebody actually say those words, I'm speaking for God, we'd go run away. We'd be really suspicious. But that's not really how modern day prophets do it. They're self-aware enough to know that like, I can't say it quite like that. Because if I say it like that, nobody's going to listen to me. So they say things like, if you don't do this, then you're not a Christian. Or if you don't think like this, or if you don't subscribe to this, or if you don't read this, or if you don't watch this, then you're not a real Christian. Anybody ever heard that? Anybody ever heard somebody say recently, like, you know, if you listen to this person, they're, they're not a real Christian. So how do we know? Because there are so many people uh, that you can go and you can listen to and you can watch and you can read, and they'll read the same passage and it looks a lot of different ways. It's interpreted in a lot of different ways. You can get on your like, well, wait a minute. What that person said and what that person said are totally the opposite. So God, what do I do? Well, this is where the discernment piece comes in. How do you know? Verse 16, by their fruits, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. We must, and so friends, we must use the spirit-filled discernment when we listen to our teachers and our leaders. Even when you hear me talk, and I'm not, I, don't, I don't claim to be a prophet, I don't, I don't claim that mantle, but I am a teacher of God's word. And that's why I invite you to open the Bible in front of me, because you know what? I can put whatever I want up on that screen. Would you know the difference? Would you know the difference? I should do it as an experiment some way. You can see if anybody notices. If I just started changing phrases and words on the slides in the Bible verses, and I can make them really subtle so it sounds like the Bible, would you know? Do you, do you know this book enough that when you hear something that just isn't quite right, that you can go, wait a minute, that doesn't sound quite... Now, now, let me clarify that. What I don't mean is when you hear something different than the way you interpret the Bible. That doesn't mean somebody's a false teacher if they teach in a way that you've never heard before. It might be just you never heard it before. But does it match with the overall theme of Genesis to Revelation, the scripture, the story that God is telling us. Do you know this word? This is why we do Bible study. This is why we've been doing immersed. It's like we want ourselves to get immersed in this word, immersed in what God is telling us, so that when you hear teaching, you can have this filter to say, well, is that accurate? But there's also this fruit piece. I don't want to keep going. He says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into their fire. Thus, by, your, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So we talk about the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we were in Bible study on Wednesday night. We were talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Trinity, and how, if we're being honest, for most of us, the Holy Spirit is the most mysterious we don't really understand who the Holy Spirit is. We don't really understand what the Holy Spirit does. We maybe have a few ideas here and there, but, you know, we've seen, you know, paintings of Jesus. We, 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 sit, we say in our Father, but the Holy Spirit, it's a little bit elusive, but we need God's Holy Spirit. We need God's spirit to be able to live this life, this Jesus way that he's called us to. But we need God's spirit to work in our minds to say, you know what? What's going on in me? We, we've just talked last Sunday about self-awareness. That before we start casting aspersions or before we start condemning people, are we willing to do the hard work inside? And Jesus has been doing this for the entire Sermon on the Mount. He has been inviting us to look at our hearts, to really examine what's going on in our hearts. So that's why at the beginning of this passage, when it talks about the wide and narrow road, if we immediately default and say, well, I'm, of course, on the narrow road. I got this. 
why would the entire Sermon on the Mount be incredibly challenging only to end up being like, "Ah, but you're good, right? You got it, we're good. Now, I don't want to say that Having said that, I'm not trying to say that we should walk out of here with great amounts of fear and anxiety. What I do suggest is that we walk out of here with great amounts of humility. To say, Lord, is there something that you're trying to show me in this word that I don't know yet? And man, I've been reading this thing for a long time. Anybody else in the room been reading this word for a long time? Still, I still learn stuff. I hope you do too. I hope you don't just read. And, and it's, it's really seductive, right? I mean, I think sometimes we, when we get to the familiar passages, we just sort of be like, yeah, I know this. And I, I do it too. When I hear that somebody's going to preach on a familiar passage, I kind of like, okay, I'm going to have to pay attention because I know where you're going with this. But I'll tell you, when we actively invite God's spirit to work in our hearts and to work on our understanding to say, God, will you... Show me something that I don't know. Will you show me how I need this word, this scripture to connect into my life? And God, will you help me understand and have discernment about the voices that I listen to? Jesus says, will you recognize them by their fruit? What is the fruit? Now, I think in our churches, in the American church, Pastors are typically judged by how many people go to their church, how many books they sold, how many subscribers to their podcast. The fruit is about size and impact, right? Oh, I listen. I love listening to them. They, you know, I that you know the people that are on TV, the people that are, and I'm not saying all the people that have podcasts and books are 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 false teachers. I'm not saying that at all, but. Fruit is not that. When Jesus says you will recognize them by their fruit, it's not based on how many followers they have, how big their congregations are, how much money they've raised. See, that's our value. That's our value to say, like, we, well, you know, it's, what is that, like, a million people can't be wrong. You know, that's the old advertising slogan, like, well, if a whole bunch of people are following it, it must be true, except when you see where we started, What road leads to destruction? The wide one, right? Just because a whole crowd of people is going that way doesn't mean that's where we're supposed to go. It takes discernment. It takes wisdom. Now, acknowledging that, you also look at the end of how Scripture ends up at Revelation chapter 7, where it talks about a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So it's not to say that there's only going to be like five people. It's not, we're not saying that like, it's going to be a tiny group of people, but in comparison to all the people who have ever lived, to all the great multitudes, that odds are most people are going to choose the wide road, the popular road, the road that gets the most clicks, that gets the most views on YouTube. That get, that, that's going to be who we say, well, I'm going to trust in them because all these other people trust in them, so I'm going to trust in them too. But Jesus gives a different measurement about fruits. And it's in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there are no law. I have those committed to memory because when I was a little kid, I got lifesavers in children's church for memorizing the fruits of the Spirit. So that was a great tool. Sunday school teachers, there you go. Fruity lifesavers will help kids learn the fruits of the Spirit. I'll never forget it. But it's one thing to know these words. It's a whole other thing to hold your life up to them. When you think about your relationship with Jesus, Would you say that the trajectory of your growth is to be more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, with greater patience, greater kindness, greater goodness, more faithfulness, more gentleness, and more self-control? 
When you listen to those podcasts, when you read those articles, when you watch those videos, do they make you more loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, and self-controlling? Are the people who are saying these things in the name of Jesus, do they also reflect those fruits? Now, I say that to say, like, I know that I am not perfectly self-controlled or perfectly faithful, or, but we can't separate the two. I think we've taken that do not judge scripture out of context that we talked about last week, and we just want to overlook. This person is a real jerk, but they say some good stuff. Jesus would disagree. Jesus would say, well, the message and the messenger are to be tested against the evidence of God's spirit present in both. And those of us who stand in front of people like I'm doing right now and proclaim God's word, there's some pretty uh, significant um, sobering words that I'm accountable. I'm accountable for what I get up here and say. I'm accountable for what I do on on Wednesdays in the Bible study. So i got to make sure that I'm not just saying whatever I want to say up here. But there has to be accountability. I hope that there is. I hope that, man, if there was something that was, you saw me doing something that was just way out there, that was not loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, or self-controlled, that you would be like, Pastor, um, I know you just preach about that. And you know what? That's, that happens. I'm just going to confess in front of you. I can preach a sermon on patience and then hit every stinking red light on the way home from church today. I can sing a song about it is well with my soul and go out in the parking lot and have somebody ding up my car and it is not well with my soul anymore. Can I get an amen? Is anybody else there? But this is what we are pursuing. This is why the Jesus way is worth it. I asked a question at the beginning, is it worth it? Could you imagine your life? Go back one slide, Paula. Could you imagine your life with more of those attributes in it? Could you imagine your relationships with more of that in your life? Could you imagine what this family would look like if we said that is our target? That's what we're going for. Because wrapped up in all that is ultimately what Jesus is all about. What does Jesus say is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourselves. You cannot do one without the other. They are connected. You cannot say, Jesus, I love you, but that person's a jerk. Jesus, I love you, but you must not love them. Jesus, I love you, but let's forget about that's that. Or just have these close, familiar relationships and say, but I don't love God. Like, it's connected. It's interconnected, and where the church, we have not done well representing ourselves in the world is when one of those breaks down. When we stop, when we, when we forget to love God and to love God without our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we forget to love each other the way we would want to be loved, that is ultimately what this is all about. So friends, how are you walking the narrow way? How are you intentionally saying, I am going to put one foot in front of the other and I am going to pursue this life that is not easy, that is actually challenging, it's countercultural, it's not popular, it's not probably going to gain you like 
a ton more friends. It's not going to gain you a ton more material possessions, but it is the good life. Do we believe it? Do we believe that Jesus' life is a good life? So how are you walking that way? And secondly, who are the voices that you're listening to? When you think about the amount of time that you have over the course of a week, what percentage of those voices are exhibiting the fruits that we talked about and help you cultivate those fruits in your life? We get to choose what voices we tune into. We get to choose what who we give our money to, who we give our time to, who we give our attention to. We get to choose. Who are you tuning into? Who are those voices that you're listening to? And then finally, how are you using Holy Spirit-led discernment? When you think about the choices that God has laid before you, when you think about the the trajectory of your life, where you are headed, what your goals are, what your hope, hopes are, what your dreams are. Somebody asked me this last week, it was a great question. What is your dream for Trinity Church? You know what my dream for this church is? That Trinity each day becomes a more and more biblically functioning church is that there's more people who are serving and living into the life that God's called them to, that are living into their calling, that more and more people are using the gifts that God has given them, that more and more people are sharing in this ministry, have have realized that, yes, I want to participate. I want to be a part of what God's doing. Did Did you hear what I didn't include in that? It didn't include anything about attendance or money. Because attendance and money, we need those to keep going. I'm not going to be I'm not going to be false about that. We this church is only sustainable with a certain amount of people and a certain amount of income coming in. But that's not the target. That's a means to continuing to exist. But that's not the our goal is not to exist. Our goal is to go and make disciples, to represent Jesus everywhere we go, to love God and to love people. That is the target. Those other things are just a way to continue to keep doing that. But we're invited. And so we ask God to guide us. We ask God to lead us. We, we put our lives in God's hands. We, we come open-armed and open-handed and say, God, would you take what I have, who I am, who you've created to be, who you've created me to be, and could you do something with this life? And God's answer is always going to be yes. I can do something with you. I can take what you have and multiply it, but it's not on us. It's not on our, our, according to our giftedness or our education or our finances or any of that kind of stuff. It all has to do with us being available and willing to go where God wants us to go, to do the things God wants us to do, And be the people that God has called us to be. So God, will you guide us? Will you help us to open up our hands and trust and actually believe that your life, the good life that you call us to, that that many are going to just forego because we've convinced ourselves that it's not such a good life. God, will you move in our hearts to remind us how good it is to be with you? Will you remind us how good it is to put our life in your hands? Will you remind us, God, that you are good and that you are faithful? And as you've guided your women and men throughout history, you guide us in this moment, God. We are a part of a way bigger story than just this congregation. So would you lead us? Give us the courage to follow you wherever you would lead us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us as we respond to what we've heard this morning?
willing to be led. We, pray, we, we sang the guide me, but is that the posture of your heart? God is leading us to a new place, and you'll notice um, on the cover of the bulletin that for this series and coming, there, we always have these roads. But you know what you don't ever get to see? The destination. Because we don't know exactly. We just want to be a church that continues to lean into how God is leading us. And that's a step-by-step, day-by-day, week-by-week process. And where we're going in the immediate future is Advent, Christmas. We're going to, in a few minutes here, transform this whole place into an atmosphere that invites the worship of a Savior, of a Savior that's born. So I invite you to come and stay. Grab a cup of coffee. Grab some whatever we put, all the different garland and things. Lend a hand. Be a part of the family. But friends, as you go and as you, as you are God's church, might you keep your eyes on the narrow road? Might your heart be tuned into God's voice? And would you have the courage to follow him wherever he leads? Go in God's power and peace. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you. We're excited to have you.